on World News Tonight. Hotter by day. Europe reports record temperatures amidst excruciating summer heat waves. Sweden's bid. NATO chief Jen Stoltenberg asserts that Turkey has agreed to back Sweden's bid to join the military alliance. New laws. The Israeli Supreme Court passes first vote over the controversial judicial reform. And musical mermaids. Underwater Music Festival in Florida promotes responsible diving and coral barrier reef preservation. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and you are watching World News Tonight. And uh, we are just in time for the NATO summit as Turkey has agreed to ratify Sweden's bid to join the military group after over a year of refusing to back the country's application to join the military alliance. According to NATO chief Jan Stoltenberg on Monday, Turkey has agreed to back Sweden's bid to join the NATO military alliance. I have uh, just had a constructive uh, meeting with President Erdogan and Prime Minister Christensen. I'm glad to announce uh, that as a result, uh, President Erdogan has agreed to forward uh, the accession protocol for Sweden to the Grand National Assembly as soon as uh, possible and work closely with the Assembly to ensure ratification. The announcement came after Stoltenberg held talks with Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and Swedish Prime Minister Ulf Kristensen in Lithuania. The decision on Sweden's NATO bid comes despite Erdogan insisting on Monday that Sweden should be considered for the military alliance after Turkey joins the European Union. Despite the support from Turkey, Stoltenberg said this does not mean Sweden will immediately become the next member of the alliance and refrained from giving a specific timeline for membership. I will not give you exact dates for that, but this is a clear commitment uh, and the president has made it clear that it will happen as soon as possible. Ultimately, Erdogan's decision marked a significant U-turn from a previous firm stance against Sweden's attempts to join. Turkey had mainly opposed Sweden's NATO membership due to claims that the Nordic nation allows members of recognized Kurdish terror groups to operate in the country, most notably the militant Kurdistan Workers' Party. It also recently accused Sweden of allowing Islamophobic demonstrations, such as the burning of the Quran. Despite this, the NATO chief said the two sides had worked closely together to address Turkey's legitimate security concerns, leading to the breakthrough. Now over at the ASEAN, foreign ministers gathered in Indonesia for talks dominated by the plan to release wastewater and the crisis in Myanmar, with the regional bloc divided over how or whether to re-engage with the cool, cracked country's ruling junta. High on the agenda for Southeast Asia's top diplomats will be the crisis in Myanmar and the tensions in the South China Sea, with Japan's planned release of treated radioactive water from the Fukushima nuclear plant also set to be discussed. While South Korea has expressed that it respects the recent report from the IAEA, China is continuing its opposition, with a meeting arranged where Beijing will urge ASEAN members to put pressure on Tokyo to halt the water discharge plan. South Korean Foreign Minister Park Jin is also set to attend the meeting from Wednesday and will take part in a number of sideline meetings. He is scheduled to join the South Korea ASEAN Foreign Ministers meeting and the ASEAN Plus 3 meeting on Thursday and will take part in the East Asia Summit meeting and the ASEAN Regional Forum on Friday. In between the sessions, Park could potentially hold separate bilateral talks with his Japanese and Chinese counterparts where Japanese Foreign Minister Yoshimasa Hayashi may explain to Park the findings of the IAEA's report on Tokyo's plan to discharge contaminated water from the Fukushima nuclear plant, with South Korea also presenting its own assessment of the discharge plan. Climate change takes its toll on human lives as more than 61,000 people have been reported dead due to the heat during Europe's record-breaking summer last year calling for more to be done to protect against even deadlier heat waves expected in the coming years. As the world sizzles with consecutive heat waves, temperature records are being broken fast. Last month was the hottest June ever recorded. But scientists are warning that it's only the beginning with the consequences of El Nino around the corner. So El Nino hasn't had as much of an effect as it's going to later in the year. 
So we're seeing these high temperatures in you know, the North Atlantic, et cetera, despite the fact that El Nino hasn't really got going yet. You know, we can expect much higher temperatures from the El Nino in you know, the latter half of the year, in sort of October, November time. El Nino is a climate phenomenon that occurs when warm water builds up along the equator in the eastern Pacific. First observed in 17th century Peru, El Nino is cyclical and happens every two to seven years for 12 to 18 months. It leads to heavy rain in South America and California, or conversely, to little rainfall in Asia and Australia. This, in turn, can cause wildfires and droughts, as well as outbreaks of diseases such as cholera. It was particularly devastating in 2016, the warmest year ever recorded. But scientists warn that a return to El Nino conditions, on top of climate change, makes it almost certain that a new global temperature record will be set in the next five years. As Europe endures record high temperatures, extreme weather casts over other parts of the world as well, including the United States, China, India and Japan, as the world recorded its hottest day on record and global average temperatures continue to climb. Extreme heat is driving extreme rain in northern India, where unusually heavy monsoons have caused deadly flooding and landslides. The residents of this village can only watch in horror from their rooftops as tree trunks and mud surge down the street. Elsewhere in the country, rising waters have destroyed bridges and roads, stranding thousands. Are you okay? Scientists say climate change is driving more severe weather everywhere, including here in New York State. A slow-moving storm dumping rain, causing flash flooding, more than 20 million people across America's Northeast now under flood alerts. They're calling this a 1,000 year event. It's only the second time ever that the National Weather Service issued a flash flood emergency. The last time was Hurricane Ida. My friends, this is the new normal. Zaragoza in Spain experienced unprecedented flooding just a few days ago. Residents caught by surprise as their roads turned to rivers. At the same time, temperatures keep climbing. The World Meteorological Organization saying the planet has probably just experienced its hottest week ever. And new research suggests Europe's hottest summer last year caused over 60,000 heat-related deaths. The impact of climate change on humans increasingly apparent as emissions continue to rise along with weather extremes. The latest developments come from Israel as the Israeli parliament has advanced a bill that would allow to overrule Supreme Court rulings and enact laws that had been struck down, despite months of protests against it. The Knesset has been one of the main priorities of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his governing coalition of far-right and ultra-Orthodox religious parties. Shouts of shame from opposition politicians in Israel's parliament, the Knesset, early Tuesday. As a controversial bill to rein in the Supreme Court's power passed the first out of three votes. The overhaul, led by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's right-wing coalition, won support from 64 out of 120 seats. The new bill strips judges of power to void decisions from government and elected officials and deem them unreasonable. Just before the vote, Netanyahu said in a video statement, the bill is not the end of democracy, it strengthens democracy. His remarks did little to calm protesters in Jerusalem, who swarmed outside the parliament on Monday ahead of the vote. Critics fear Netanyahu is curbing judicial powers as he stands trial for corruption on charges he denies. We're coming to wherever the coalition members are in order to send our message loud and clear that what this government is doing is not okay. Democracy is under attack. Israeli rights are under attack. The rights of Israeli citizens are under attack. And we're here to protect that and to say stop the coup, stop the judicial coup. Central Bank Governor Amir Yaron has urged the government to seek broad agreements over legislative changes in order to safeguard institutional independence. On Monday, he pointed to the costs of prolonged political uncertainty, citing a falling shekel and an underperforming stock market. 
Netanyahu, who is on trial on graft charges he denies, has played down economic fallout from the campaign. Protesters, meanwhile, promised to come out in force on Tuesday with no signs of tensions abating as the bill heads to its second and the final third readings. We're going into a short commercial break now. More news on the other side. Stay with us. Welcome back. Now, just hours after warning of allegations that a U.S. spy plane entered North Korea's airspace, North Korean leader sister Kim Yo-jong has sent yet another warning that the U.S. military will face severe consequences if it enters the regime's exclusive economic zone. For the second straight day, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un sister Kim Yo-jong has threatened that there will be consequences for the U.S. sending spy planes over Pyongyang's exclusive economic zone. In a statement carried by the North state-run Korean Central News Agency on Tuesday, Kim claimed that a U.S. spy plane entered the regime's EEZ eight times on Monday. She added that if the U.S. continues such actions, its military will experience, quote, a very risky flight. This comes after Kim alleged Monday evening that the North's warplanes repelled a U.S. spy plane that flew over its EEZ, calling it a grave violation of the regime's sovereignty and security. Earlier in the day, the North's defense ministry released a statement which seemed to imply that the spy planes intruded into the regime's territorial airspace, saying that the planes flew into its inviolable airspace. Territorial airspace extends 12 nautical miles from the coast, whereas the EEZ extends 200 miles and is not considered a country's airspace under international law. In response, the U.S. State Department urged Pyongyang to refrain from escalating tensions and reiterated that Washington is open to dialogue. When talking about Kim's remarks, Pentagon Deputy Spokesperson Sabrina Singh said that Washington remains committed to safely and responsibly flying, sailing and operating anywhere that international law allows. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff also responded. U.S. air surveillance assets conduct routine reconnaissance flights around the Korean peninsula and North Korea's claim of airspace violation is not true. We strongly urge the North to immediately stop creating tension with these false claims. Experts say such actions could be a way for the North to justify its future provocations, which could take place sometime before or after a major military parade planned for July 27, known as Victory Day in the regime. Another possible reason could be the first nuclear consultative group meeting between South Korea and the U.S. that will take place in Seoul next Tuesday. The group, which was launched during President Yoon suk yeols state visit to the U.S. in April, will discuss information sharing, consultation mechanisms, joint planning and execution to increase nuclear deterrence against North Korea. The Spanish Coast Guard says that it has rescued 86 people from a boat off the Canary Islands that had been spotted by a rescue plane. A plane and a ship were dispatched to initially search for a fishing vessel from Senegal that had about 200 people on board and had been missing for nearly two weeks. At least 86 migrants were intercepted and rescued by Spanish authorities off the Canary Islands on Monday while searching for a different boat that's been missing for weeks and may have hundreds aboard. A reconnaissance plane spotted a dinghy carrying 80 men and six women to the south of the island of Grand Canaria. The migrants were then transferred to a Coast Guard vessel and brought to shore, where they were met by emergency services. A rescue operation has been underway after the other fishing boat carrying around 200 migrants from a conflict-prone region of Senegal went missing two weeks ago. And a migrant aid group said two other boats, both carrying at least 50 passengers, which left from the same region around the same time in late June, were also missing. The Atlantic migration route is one of the world's deadliest. At least 559 people died in 2022 in attempts to reach the Canary Islands, according to the United Nations. The condition of the migrants is unknown, and their families back home have reportedly lost contact. A spokesperson for the rescue operation said it was not immediately clear whether the boat intercepted Monday was one of the missing boats, and that only a further investigation would determine its point of origin. 
Iraq and French oil major Total Energy signed a long-delayed $27 billion energy deal that aims to increase oil production and boost the country's capacity to produce energy with four oil, gas and renewable projects. Iraq has signed a massive deal with French oil major Total Energies to develop the country's energy sector. The agreement is valued at $27 billion and is meant to boost output of oil, gas and renewables. It was actually first signed back in 2021, but has since faced delays amid disputes between Iraqi politicians over the terms. On Monday, Total Energy's CEO Patrick Pouyane said the work could now progress rapidly. It depends on the projects. I believe that the first part of the solar plant will come within two years. After that, we will work to do a first part of the oil part, which should increase production to 120,000 barrels per day within two years as well. We have four years of work to spend more than $10 billion, so it's a huge project. Four projects, in fact. Iraq will have a smaller than expected 30% stake in the projects. Total Energies gets 45% and Qatar Energy 25%. Specific plans include recovering flared gas from oil fields and using it to supply power plants. It will also develop a solar network to supply power in one region. The country's energy minister called it the start of renewable energy in Iraq. Baghdad hopes it will also revive investor interest in its oil sector, which has seen output stagnate. Other majors like ExxonMobil and BP have cut back their operations there in recent years. Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg said Twitter rival threads cross 100 million signups in five days, dethroning ChatGPT as the fastest online platform to hit the milestone. Meta Platform's new social media app Threads, the first serious rival to Elon Musk's Twitter, has already hit a milestone. Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg on Monday said Threads has notched more than 100 million signups in just five days, dethroning ChatGPT as the fastest online platform to reach that benchmark number. Threads has been setting new records for user additions since its launch last week, with celebrities such as Jennifer Lopez and Kim Kardashian joining the platform. The new app, which pitches itself as the friendly option for public discourse online, shares some resemblance to Twitter. It allows posts that are up to 500 characters long and includes links, photos, and videos of up to five minutes. But it does not yet have a direct messaging function or a desktop version that some users, such as businesses, rely on. Twitter has responded by threatening to sue Meta over the app, alleging that it used Twitter's trade secrets and other confidential information. But legal experts say that claim could be hard to prove. And the turmoil at Twitter, including Musk's recently imposed limits on the number of tweets users can see, could potentially help threads gain more users and advertisers. Still, with nearly 240 million monetizable daily active users, Twitter likely won't bow to its new challenger anytime soon. Threads is currently ad-free, and Zuckerberg has said Meta would only think about monetization once there was a clear path to one billion users. Welcome back to World News, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A volcano has erupted on the Rajans Peninsula in southwest Iceland near the capital Reykjavik following intense earthquake activity in the area. The Icelandic Meteorological Office said the eruption was very small with no direct imminent hazard to people living within the region. Indonesia's Coast Guard confirmed that it has seized an Iranian flag super tank and suspected of involvement in the illegal transshipment of crude oil and vowed to strengthen maritime patrols. Residents of South Africa's biggest city, Johannesburg, were stunned by the first snowfall in more than a decade while some parts of South Africa regularly experience snowy winters. Johannesburg last saw snow in August 2012. Home to the world's largest aging population, China focuses on developing cutting-edge technology to utilize robots as caregivers for older adults, revolutionizing how aging populations are cared for. Novak Djokovic and Carlos Alcaraz remained on collision course at Wimbledon and the fourth round victories with Elena Rebekina and Ons Jabir set up a repeat of last year's final. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. 
And in case you missed to watch any of the stories tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we leave you tonight with the Underwater Music Festival, entertaining divers and snorkelers in the Florida Keys while highlighting the preservation of the continental United States' only living coral barrier reef. Thanks for watching. Stay safe and have a good night.